Shalom, everyone. In the Nazarim, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. Merry Christmas. Hello, everybody. My name's Lou White, and uh, I'm here to discuss with you today another stronghold that people are in the thought prison of. It's a fortress of thinking that people are trapped by when they're born into the world. And this particular topic is going to expose and reveal to everyone of all ages exactly who Santa Claus is. <clears throat> and it's going to be a point of view. It's not going to be your point of view that you were taught. And what cr a Christmas tree actually is. And uh, the point of view that we're interested in is not so much what cultures thought it was to them just a few hundred years ago, but it goes way, way back. And, uh, you know, it's so important that we can't afford to get it wrong. You can't trust this, the stuff that we've been taught, you know? Anyway, Norse mythology, which is rather recent, Norse mythology, you know, a lot of the names of the days of the week are actually named after Norse deities, you know? Um, <clears throat> But it actually goes back farther than that to the Moabites and the Sidonians and other pagan cultures all the way back to Babylon. But um, there was a fellow, or not a fellow, there was a, there's a demon running around that goes by many names. And we're going to delve into that a little bit. But I want to start out by just mentioning that we're, we're appealing to Yahusha to instruct us in his truth because he, he said he promised to guide us into all truth through his spirit in us. Now the Norse mythology inherited ancient pagan patterns from the Moabites and the Sidonians and that will be two main things. One is Santa Claus and the other one is the Christmas tree. Now this sounds fab fa fantastic but it's, what, it's true. Now there was a deity in the ancient world called M-O-L-O-C-H. We don't pronounce their names. This deity was very interested in children because children were offered to this being in his arms and they sat in his lap. Now that sounds a little bit like Santa Claus. And we're going to see pictures of this thing. Now I want to start out by saying too that the other, there's a, th this being that we're, we're talking about where like the Santa Claus and children sitting in his lap uh, turned into the Norse deity that is called O-D-I-N. O-D-I-N is also the same as W-O-D-E-N, which gives us the name of the fourth day of the week in, in our Western culture. It, they call it W-O-D-E-N's day. He had an eight-legged eight horse. Now, an eight-legged horse named Schleppner. Now, he supposedly rode this eight-legged horse through the skies and in the what what they call Valhalla which is heaven in the Norse mythology this is a blueprint of exactly what Santa Claus does also because remember M-O-L-O-C-H and of the Moabites and O-D-I-N of the Norse is the same person it's it's actually a you know the fallen demon you know uh, Satan himself but he was riding through the air, the heavens, Valhalla, on an eight-legged horse. How many reindeer does Santa Claus have? Well, except for Rudolph, he has eight. Eight reindeer. And it wasn't until the early part of the 1900s that an additional reindeer was named, and that's Rudolph. That was just made up, you know. But there were eight reindeer, and there were eight legs on this horse of this ODIN. You know, and that's more than a correlation. That's a, that isn't a coincidence. But anyway, let's read something real quick from Yeshayahu or Isaiah, chapter 42, just three verses. Thus said El, Yahuwah, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people in it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, 
Yahuwah, have called you in righteousness, and I take hold of your hand and guard you, and give you for a covenant to a people, for a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am Yahuwah, that is my name. And I, in my esteem, I do not give to another, nor my praise to idols. And we're going to start out right here uh, at the beginning of the seminar. This is going to take about an hour, but you're going to be very intrigued. We're going to start off with some traditional terms, and then we're going to use, show the covenant. Now, our minds are the battlefield in the war in heaven, and this is a war. You're soldiers. Now, the traditional terms are here on the left, and L-O-R-D is... Translated into Hebrew is B-A-A-L. All right, right off the bat, we see we've been de deceived. The name is Yahuwah, and we just read something, and he identified himself. And J-E-S-U-S -S is a constructed name from various translations and transliterations. And it means the horse in Hebrew, Jesus. Doesn't mean anything except that. But it has other meanings in Greek and Latin. But the real meaning is Yah is our deliverer, and it's Yahusha, or Yahushua. And the, word, the Greek Christos, we don't need any Christos. We don't need any Greek. That's a translation, and, it, and its root is Christianos, which goes back to the original meaning of the word Christianos is Cretan, you know, a person who's an idiot. And that's what they were first called. They weren't calling themselves idiots or Christianos. They were, ca they were called that by outsiders. We're called Nazarene, the followers of the, of the Messiah. Now, Mashiach is a more of a accurate Hebrew translation. G-O-D is another Norse into, uh, type deal, and it's the sun deity. G-O-D is a common proper noun used for pagan or Norse uh, mythological beings. The Hebrew word is El or Elohim. And the Yahudim, or th what they call today the Jews, are the descendants of a man named Yehuda. They call Judah. But his real name is Yehuda. And it's the Yahudim. That's a plural. And it means worshipers of Yah, praisers of Yah. So we're not going to call ourselves Christians either. We're going to call ourselves what we're really called, according to Acts 24, verse 5, not serene. Now, our first love, the living word, is actually a, li a living person. It's Yahusha himself. Now, first things are first, so let's go right into that. Here is the retelling of the covenant for the scattered tribes in the last days, given at Deuteronomy 5. Number one, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. So you're, when you find out who Santa Claus is, you'll want to pay very close attention to that commandment. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three, you do not cast, or that means to throw or to lift up his name, the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin. That means annihilation. For Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Now here's the fourth commandment. Guard the Sabbath day to set it apart as Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you. Six days you labor and, and shall do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah, your Elohim. You do not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant, nor your ox nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah, your Elohim, brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Number five, Respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you, so that your days are prolonged, and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. 
Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number 10, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Now, restoring the scattered tribes of Israel to the covenant in the last days will have us awaken to these laws, these covenants, these, this covenant. It's a marriage. It was given at Sinai originally, and the retelling of it was given in Deuteronomy 5 for the scattered tribes. And it continues in Deuteronomy 6 and says this, Hear, O Yisrael, that means hear and obey. Yahuwah, our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And these words, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children. And you shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now this is a study. And I've uh, basically focused it on one stronghold primarily, and it's what today is known as Christmas. Now, that word Christmas is an amalgamation or a combination of two languages. Christ, or Christ, is Greek, and mas is, is Latin. And those two put together are supposedly supposed to mean the mass of Christ. Well, the, the mass wasn't even invented until around the 6th century. But anyway, the word mass actually means to depart. You're dismissed. That's where we get the, the, the word dismissed. Misa, mass. It means to go away. It means leave. Now, anointed one is what they say Christ means in, in Greek. Well, if you put them together, it, it looks like it says anointed one, depart. That's what it looks like. Now, it's a spell, this Christmas thing, is a spell upon the whole world. New Zealand, Australia, the Philippines, United States, England, all through. It's, it's a spell people are under. Now, if you're ready to awaken, listen to what I've got to, to tell you today because it's too important to get wrong. Now, the spell of Satan's birthday how could it possibly be Satan's birthday? Aren't we, we're programmed to understand that it's not anything but the Messiah's birthday. But I'm going to show you that the origins of it are just recently changed. Now, the identity thief is the adversary. He's the one that steals the identity of all these people and, and, and deities. And he's even stolen the identity of the creator himself by removing his name from the text. If you look at the preface of your scriptures, you'll see that they've put, taken the name out and put in a word, the Lord. That is the translated meaning of the Hebrew word B-A-A-L. Now the reinventing of the birth of the son was done by several people, but I want to show you who they are and, and when they lived and why they did it. But here on the left we have a big pillar. Yahuwah in Ezekiel, or Yehezkel, chapter 8, calls this a pillar of jealousy. And it was constructed to, uh, is a phallic symbol, really, of, uh, you know, sexual worship. And in, in German, it means tannenbaum. It means fir tree. This was the image that the pagans used. They went into the groves, the forests, and they laid down under every green tree their offerings. It was an altar, is what it was. It was an actual idol. And uh, I want to ask this question, would the devil defend this and that Christmas, or would he attack it? Well, so far the adversary hasn't attacked it. But I'm going to open your eyes, you know, so that you can see what these symbols actually mean. Now, I think Satan invented it, is what happened, because Yahuwah didn't invent it. He talks about it, though, in his scriptures. Now, the most successful identity, identity thief in the whole world has an objective, and that objective has always been your mind. And he can be whoever we want him to be, because he's teaching us to be all these different people. And uh, this, this seminar presentation is going to bring up who invented the calendar that we use 
actually adjusted the calendar. I'm going to call his name Dennis because his first name is actually the name of a pagan deity. But his last name is Ezeguus. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. It could be Ezeguus or something like that, but it's known today as Ezeguus. Now, it's, he invented this calendar and he based his calendar upon his reckoning to when the, his Lord was born that he called J-E-S-U-S Christ. It was a name that was never heard on the in, eardrums of the true Mashiach. Yahushua never heard the name J-E-S-U-S on his eardrums. And I, I don't always wear red, but when I do, I prefer to be identified better because of it. That's an interesting little thing over there. Now, in Proverbs 18, 17, and this is very important to this topic, the first to state his own case seems right until another comes and examines him. So that's Proverbs 18, verse 17. Now, what we've been told, we've accepted when we were children. But when we're adults, we have to put those things aside when we actually learn the truth. Satan is an actor on a stage. And he's many different characters. It's just like when you're watching a movie and the same actor is playing different roles. Well, in this case, this character, this adversary, is playing many, many, many roles. And he goes by many, many, many names. And I want you to understand that when you're thinking of him like, like this character on the left, you can also think of him as the character on the right because he is the same character. To enchant or cast spells... One must often repeat it over and over and over until it comes true. But it only comes true in your mind because the people are being programmed with these lies. And um, interestingly enough, this holiday that we call Christmas was originally S-A-T-U-R-N-A-L-I-A. -A -A. That's what it was originally, and it was a very horrible thing. Um, anyway, this imposter has deceived the whole world and beguiled them to think that he's the sun, the actual sun in the sky. And uh, even the, the, the main constituent of the sun, which is H-E-L-U-I-M, the, the element that they call that, comes from this Hebrew word and this Greek word. Now the Hebrew is the word Hallel. It's used in the scripture, so I'll pronounce it. In Yeshayahu 14.12, or Isaiah, it says Hallel ben Shakar. That is, means brightness, Hillel. See how that is interesting that, that Hillel in Hebrew actually means brightness? And then Ben means sun, and Shikar means the, 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 the dawn. So he's called the uh, brightness son of the dawn, Hillel ben Shikar. And he was worshipped as the sun by all the nations. And it's a diversion that is actually put into our heads to divert worship away from Yahuwah and towards Hashatan. And you see on the screen here, you see a solar deities, uh, the Lord K-R-I-S-H-N-A, which is a sun deity. You see the halo? That halo is actually a pagan item. And you see the fire was the, considered to be the presence of the deity. And we have uh, this other deity over here. See how the head has a halo, a glow around it? And of course, the Roman Catholics, they inherited this same idea. And this is a statue of uh, this, you know, Buddha, this fellow, G G Siddhartha Gautama, a big statue with the sun behind it. You know, they lined it up for the photo. So these solar deities are the worship of the heavenly host. Now, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Now, this is a cartoon that was put out by uh, NewToTorah.com. New to Torah. Uh, Charlie Brown and Linus are talking. And Charlie Brown says, isn't there anyone who understands what Christmas is all about? And then Linus says, sure, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. December 25th is associated with the birth of many pagan GODs, including... The uh, M, the H, the H, the Z, and, you know. The Roman festival, S-A-T-U-R-N-A-L-I-A, -A, would also end around this time. Christianity imported many of these pagan myths and traditions into its own customs around 400 A.D. And it kept piling in them on, too. Today, Christians express outrage 
that Christmas is losing its Christian roots. This is ironic since it was Christianity that hijacked the holiday in the first place to make it easier to convert new followers. Nevertheless, every new C-H-U-R-C-H going Christians unknowingly put up ancient Babylonian fertility symbols called Christmas trees in their homes without ever asking how the tradition got started in the first place and not knowing what their own B-I-B-L-E warns against this practice, like in Jeremiah or Yermiyahu 10. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Now, here's a, here's a question. Does Yahuwah like us to learn how pagans worship their deities and then to honor him in that way? Alternately, can we just make up names to call him and adopt our own ideas of how we want to worship him? Now, first, here's some big words. Two big words. The first one is syncretism. Now, syncretism is defined as the reconciliation of different beliefs from Greek syncretismos, the union of communities, from syncretism to combine against a common enemy. One theory connects it with Christemos, or lying, from Critosian, expand, to lie like a Cretan. Another connects it with the stem of Karaninae, to mix, or blend. In other words, crosses, or mixture. So what we're dealing with here is a mixture that's been going on for many, many, well, hundreds of years. Another big word, enculturation. Now, that's the social process by which culture is learned and used by a human infant, also called socialization. It's uh, not the economic socialization. It's the actual way a person learns what the culture is, and that involves Santa Claus. That's what people are teaching their children. Now, are we, are we supposed to learn Yahuwah's culture or the world? In Leviticus, or Yachra 19, it says, Guard my laws. Do not let your livestock mate with another kind. Do not sow your field with mixed seed. And do not put a garment woven of two sorts of thread upon you. Now, transgenic tampering is mixing also, where they mix uh, genetics of creatures like, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables, animals. How much rebellion will Yahuwah actually allow until he acts? Because remember, remember, rebellion is as witchcraft. Now here's what Yahuwah's thoughts are, Deuteronomy 12, on this topic about mixing. Deuteronomy 12, starting at verse 29, When Yahuwah your Elohim does cut you off from before, before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, guard yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you, and that you do not inquire about their mighty ones, saying, How do these nations serve their mighty ones? Let me do so also, or let me do so too. Do not do so to Yahuwah your Elohim. For every abomination which Yahuwah hates they have done to their mighty ones. For they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their mighty ones. We talked about the deity that, that they offered that to. And all the words I am commanding you, guard to do it. Do not add to it, nor take away from it. Now this M-A-Y-P-O-L-E, that's an actual fertility dance. And it's a circle ribbon dance and it has a fertility ritual, and it's usually performed at midsummer. It is witchcraft. It involves three items. It involves a pole and a wreath and ribbons. Now, the weapons that are used against us usually involve pleasure, possessions, and position. Now, at Christmas time, uh, children are being tempted to pursue possessions. You know, and first John, first John chapter two, it says, do not love the world, nor with that which is in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him because all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, pleasure, the lust of the eyes, possessions, and the pride of life position is not of the father, but is of the world and the world passes away and the lust of it. But the one doing the desire of Elohim remains forever. So if we're teaching our children to ask father Christmas, for possessions, then we're violating what this text is actually saying. And um, now, who is Santa? I, I was correlating it earlier, those of you that weren't here. Um, he is one of the actors that Satan uses. He's got many, many roles in this play. 
Satan plays many, many different characters. This character is actually an ancient character that was uh, an abomination of the Moabites. His name at, to them was M-O-L-O-C-H. Now that's what he kind of looked like. He had different, different looks. But basically children were put in his arms and then he would bring them to his mouth and then they would drop into his belly, into his lap. And they were emoliated in the flames, in hot coals. Searing pain was involved. Now, the pagans, when that happened, would, would ring bells and shake rattlers and blow horns to cover over the dying cries of the infant. This is Santa Claus. That's, that's who it is. Now, but who is the actor? The actor is Hashatan. And here's another picture of that same thing happening, a child being offered to this. See the smoke coming out of the chimney, out of the head? His lap was the, was the danger zone. You can't trust this. This is not safe. That's who that is. Okay. What is a Christmas tree? Well, that's an abomination of the Sidonians. The Sidonians... Well, one of, the witch, one of the daughters of the Sidonians married King Ahab of the northern tribes. She was a, a, a she was a, well, I can't pronounce her name, it's illegal. <laughs> but, because uh, her name contains a, a, a deity too. The truth will set you free, but it won't be popular. The fact that we need to ask this question, what is a Christmas tree, indicates that the object is not self-explanatory. The meaning and the source is hidden from view, and these objects are now widely accepted by nearly all secular and religious people alike. Ancient worship depicted sexual symbols of fertility, interpreted through arcane or occult objects. Now this is an object. It's, a, it's an A-S-H-E-R-A-H. It's a tree. And here's one example of 10 places in scripture that discusses this, this very same tree. Jeremiah 2 and Jeremiah 10, of course, but Jeremiah 2 says, For of old you have broken your yoke and tore off your bonds, and you said, I am not serving you, when on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down a whore. And of course, it doesn't mean that to most people. They don't, it doesn't mean that to them. What does it mean to Yahuwah, though? Uh, these trees. Now, the occult means something that's hidden or obscured. Hiding the origin of something or to block the meaning of it both raise suspicion in us. At least it does me. When you try to hide something, then it makes it even more tantalizing to find out and uncover. If we're walking in the truth, we must search out everything we practice and teach our children. Here is the definition of the word occult. Secret, not divulged. From the Latin occultus, hidden, concealed. Secret. And it, it means to cover over or conceal. And it, it is from the word ab or over, and it, plus the verb related to salare, to hide. The symbolic meaning is not apprehended by the mind beyond the range of understanding. Now, our investigation here is this, to answer this question. Is Christmas witchcraft? In other words, is it rebellion? Absolutely, it, in, it, it certainly is, because it involves all these different things. The elven mythology involved witchery, and it, uh, the greenery was used to repel evil. They thought that if they put the, the decorations of green all over their homes and, and buildings and businesses, that they would actually be protected from evil by this, these ivy leaves and all these different uh, holly and all that. And they put witch balls up, you know to capture the demons, to hold them prisoners. But those witch balls had another meaning. It was fertility. And the wreath is going to get the shaft here. I'm going to show you the association between that uh, M-A-Y pole. Uh, there's uh, Sherlock Holmes, who's a non, he's probably uh, not real, but <laughs> he's a character also. But in the ancient world, pagans went to their temples, and they worshipped their false deities of fertility and had sex with the temple prostitutes, both male and female. The pagan temple had an image, usually at the entrance, and at the entrance, called an obelisk, and this was standing near the entrance, as we see in this photo in Luxor, Egypt. 
And of course, this depicted something, you know. It was, uh, and there's one at the Vatican also. See, now, this is a sexual object. All of these things mean the same thing. There's a witch hat, that means the same thing. The Christmas tree. And the wreath is another object. Can we adopt detestable things and believe that they're now cleansed because we don't think about them in their true origins? Did the Messiah Yahusha have a Christmas tree or a wreath? Or did these practices originate from a dark place and get adopted? Well, they all admit that they did adopt it. Where did it come from? Is it innocent? The way we express our devotion to our creator, Yahuwah, must never include behavior that's detestable to him, as he advised us at Deuteronomy 12, 28 through 32. Now, the practices that we've inherited from our fathers, now our literal fathers have taught us these patterns, many of us, in our homes. And we've br- they, they got the tree, and they got the wreath, and they got the presents under the tree. They were, it was always things under the tree. Now, Jeremiah 16, 19 mentions that we've inherited nothing but lies from our fathers. In the last days, people will come to Yahuwah and and claim that. And uh, sometimes we can think of the catechetical school at Alexandria where the circus fathers propagated a lot of these lies, you know. They blended things. They got things mixed together. See, they've got truth and error mixed together. Now, trees or A-S-H-E-R-I-M. Actually, the word asher in Hebrew means happy. It means really. Are you happy? A-S-H-E-R-I-M is a word often translated as groves. Groves. And it means trees. Trees. Now, Jeremiah 10, let's read those words. Thus said Yahuwah, do not learn the way of the Gentiles and do not be awed by the signs of the heavens, For the Gentiles are awed by them. For the the prescribed customs of these peoples are worthless. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of a craftsman with a cutting tool. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it does not topple. And Deuteronomy 7, in verse 26, says, And do not bring an abomination into your house, lest you be accursed like it. Utterly loathe it. And utterly hate it, for it is accursed. Now, see also Ezekiel chapter 6, verse 13. Now, those are objects of fertility, okay? We don't, we don't want to do those things. Those are deities. They're altars. They're deities. They have names. Can we have fellowship with Yahusha and remain blind to the truth? Can we just not think about it and just say, oh, it doesn't mean that to me? Well, the Christmas tree is an A-S-H-E-R-A-H. It's a sexual object, and it's learned from the Sidonian witch. Now, the, he, she was the wife of Ahab. Look at 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16. It was a pattern from Babel, and this witch supported 450 prophets of B-A-A-L, the Lord, and 400 prophets of this A-S-H-E-R-A-H, the consort of B-A-A-L. The Hebrew word B-A-A-L means Lord. And this is the device of Shaitan whereby he deceives the nations. And the translators removed the true name, Yahuwah, from the scriptures and replaced it with Lord. Just look at the preface of your translation. Thus causing the identity of Yahuwah to be stolen. In other words, the actor even stole the identity of Yahuwah himself. B-A-A-L, the Lord, and A-S-H-E-R-A-H are crawling all over Christian minds. And the mind is the true battlefield of the war in heaven. Now, in 1 John, it says, in starting at verse 6, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we're not doing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Yahushua, Messiah, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, elves, fairies, and enchanted reindeer. We talked about the reindeer. There's eight reindeer because there were eight legs on Schleppner, O-D-I-N's horse. Uh, Magic, flying carpets, fertility symbols. Witchcraft is as witchcraft does. When people celebrate this adopted behavior, it's idolatry. 
and mixed worship. Now, if you're, not, if you're blind to the witchery, we're going to continue more and more into the details of it. We, we, we've identified what these objects are, and we've even made a relationship between this and that deity, M-O-L-O-C-H. The authentic reindeer, I uh, know, the authentic redeemer, was born, was born during a commanded festival of, uh, at Sukkoth. The commanded festival of Sukkoth is hardly known at all by the world, but we, not Sarim, are under understanding that the festivals of Yahuwah and the scriptures, as they're written, are to be practiced because they unveil what they really are as they're fulfilled, because they're shadows of things that are, that are to come. Now, Sukkoth means booths or tents, and it's, and it's conducted in the fall of the year in the seventh month of the real Hebrew year. And uh, that usually coincides with the seventh month of um, the Roman year, or the original Roman year, before they added two months. September is actually the word seven in Latin. And October is eight, November is nine, and December means ten. But of course, they added two more months in the uh, year 43 BCE. But here's the, here's the truth. Septum is Latin for seven. And originally, that's, that was the seventh month also. Now, the shepherds were the only ones that were told. The Magi were two years away from the night of his birth. But uh, the, these were called Bedouin, the shepherds. They're, they're goat, herder, goat herders and sheep herders. And uh, Yahushua's birth was during Sukkoth. Now, Christmas was banned by Christians. The first settlers of North America were believers and followers of the Messiah, but they did not observe Christmas. It was banned in several colonies because of its pagan origins. Yahushua's only use of a tree was at his death. Yahushua's only use of a tree was at his death. Israel was warned about using trees for worship in Jeremiah 10 and Ezekiel 8. The idea of Christmas was adopted from the birth of the sun deity. And who is the sun deity? Hashatan. Yahushua was born during the feast of Sukkoth, called booths, tabernacles, or tents. And it's a shadow of redemption. The, the early settlers of North America knew these things. And that's why they were in North America trying to get away from uh, you know, Geneva and England and all those things. Now, the circumstances of Yahushua's birth reveal what Sukkoth foreshadowed. And uh, his second coming will be the wedding feast of the Lamb at, at that same time of year. So it's really interesting. The completion of his redemption of his bride, Yisrael. And Yisrael, believe it or not, are the nations. You're, that's what this is about. It's to call back and restore the scattered sheep to the covenant. In Luke 2, it, it, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 30, it says, For my eyes have seen your deliverance. Now, here's uh, the A-S-H-E-R-A-H a little bit more. The occult fertility symbol. And it was the idolatrous abomination of the Sidonians. You remember the witch married Ahab and taught all of northern Israel to do these things. And that was why Elijah was given the task of, uh, you know, confronting them at Mount Carmel, to confront them and say, you know, is Yahuwah the Elohim or is, are your de deities Elohim? Now here's a photograph of the Germans celebrating Christmas with their Fuhrer, Hitler, and many Jesuits became officers in the Nazi SS. And Mussolini, I think, is sitting at the table also enjoying a Christmas celebration. And you can see these trees and the table are actually containing the trees too. You know, they've got little trees and big trees. So there's witchery all around. Now there's two levels of interpretation. When you look at a pagan object, the masses see one thing and the uh, initiated see another. And I'm showing you what the truth of this thing is, see? So you can look at it and say, oh, that's not a witch ball. No, really, it isn't? Well, it is to the witches. The witches are where it came from, the people that were in rebellion against Yahuwah. That's what witchcraft is, rebellion. And so those that rebel teach the rebellion, but they do it by occulting the real meaning 
they occulted. Now, here's another picture of Hitler celebrating his father's birthday. And you know who his father's birthday, you know who his father is. Because the person whose birthday it really is, is the sun deity in the winter for the northern hemisphere. And it's Hashatan. It's Hashatan's birthday. It's not, Yahusha had nothing to do with it. Now, there was three elements in these trees. Tree, the tree itself, and the balls, and the tinsel. So, if ignorance is bliss, then knowledge must be really painful. I know it's painful for me to tell you this stuff. But Ecclesiastes 1, verse 18 says, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases suffering. So that's what we're feeling right now. We're feeling that. If you increase your knowledge, it's going to hurt. Revelation 17 identifies a beast. And there's a beast and there's a woman riding the beast. Okay? We're going to see a little bit of that. You know, the beast, that which you saw, was and is not, and is about to come up out of the pit of the deep and goes to destruction. And those dwelling on the earth, whose names are not written in the book of life, from the foundation of the world, shall marvel when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, here, here comes some more truth. Who's behind all this? Well, we started out telling you. Hashatan. It's the dragon. Now, in 1936, you'll see a, you see a picture here in 1936 of a Berlin Olympic game. In Berlin, they had the Olympic Games in 1936. And note the altar of ZEUS burning at the top center. There it is. Whose altar is that? Well, the, every Olympic game has these things. The torch is the emblem of the deity, which is Hashatan, the sun deity. They bring the flame. They, they proudly do it. Christians will run with this torch and say, I've got the, the presence of the deity. And then they light the altar in this big cauldron is, the, is where the altar is. <coughs> Hitler was the defender of the faith for the Holy Roman Empire, the Third Reich. Now you can see in this picture I've illustrated and put the word beast right on him. And the woman who is known as C-I-R-C-E, the bride of the dragon. Because you see, Actually, there's two brides. There's Satan's bride, and there's Yahuwah's bride. Yahuwah's bride doesn't do pagan stuff. Which one are you? <laughs> well, we were all taught to be the dragon's bride. Because the, bri the, the dragon is the one that gives authority to the beast. So I'm not going to say some of these things out loud. I'm going to let you all read the screen. But it says, uncovering the nakedness. So what the meaning of the balls are and the tinsel and the ribbons and the wreath. Now, the, uh, the thing of it is this can't just be a coincidence. This is, this is not invented by me or some people 100 years ago. This is ancient stuff. Anyway, the witch's cone of power hat. Well, it's, the power that it involves is regenerative power. You know, the male uh, phallus. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And so a picture is worth a thousand words. Now Herod wanted to know when and where the Messiah was being born. In Matthew chapter 2, I'm going to read starting at verse 5, it says, And they said to him, this is his, uh, his people that were studying the Torah, they, they had, he had asked them where he was going to be born. And they said, In, in Bethlehem of Yehuda." For thus it says, has been written by the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Yehuda, you are by no means least among the rulers of Yehuda, for out of you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, having called the Magi secretly, learned exactly from what time the star appeared. And having sent them to Bethlehem, he said, Go and search diligently for, for the child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me, so that I too might go and do reverence to him. And having heard the sovereign, they went, and see the star, which they had seen in the east, went before them. And it came and stood over where the child was. And seeing the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And coming into the house, not the stable, because the child is about two years old now, they saw the child with Miriam, his mother, and fell down and did reverence to him. 
And opening their treasures, they presented their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Now here's how Satan's birthday became adopted. He stole all the credibility and identity of Yahuwah. Now the new Shaf Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, in its article on Christmas, declares these words. How much the date of the festival depended upon the pagan B-R-U-M-A-L-I-A, that's December 25th, following the S-A-T-U-R-N-A-L-I-A, December 17th through the 24th, and celebrating the shortest day of the year and the new sun cannot be accurately determined. The pagan S day and B day were too deeply entrenched in popular custom to, to be set aside by Christian influence. The pagan festival with its riot and merrymaking was so popular that Christians were glad of an excuse to continue its celebration with little change in spirit and manner. Christian preachers of the West and the Near East protested against the unseemly frivolity with which Christ's birthday was celebrated. While Christians of Mesopotamia, in other words, in the far further eastern regions, they accused their western brethren of idolatry and sun worship for adopting as Christian this pagan festival. The reason was that it was adopted was people chose to not serve Yahuwah because they were already le being led by the adversary. I mean, they, he had already taken over their religion, you know. One man established the most misunderstood date in the world, and that, I want to call him Dennis. Dennis Exiguus, and he was born in 470 BC, or no, AD, 470 he was born, in what he called AD, and he died around 544. Now, he was the most learned abbot in Rome, and Dennis is best known as the inventor of the Anno Domini era, or error, because it's at least five years off. Now, how this was done. In the year 525, Dennis, or Exiguus, declared the present year to be 525. And it was 525 years since the incarnation of our Lord Jehoshua Christ. The Anno Domini era became dominant in Western Europe only after it was used by the Venerable Bede to date the events of his ecclesiastical history of the English people, which was completed in the year 731. Adopting paganism became policy. The Christian era, supposed to have its starting point in the year of Yahushua's birth, is based on a miscalculation introduced in 525 by Dennis Exiguus. Now the most misunderstood man in the world says, I don't always celebrate Christmas, but when I do, I prefer to ignore its pagan origins. <laughs> what? Okay, now here's a picture of Putin at the Santa's palace in Russia. And that bear and Putin are just metaphorical. I guess the bear would represent the pagan origins, and it's coming after him. Anyway, this term, S-A-T-U-R, that's a, a festival, and it's originally the worship of, a, of the Moabite deity, M-O-L-O-C-H. Now, the Roman version was a week-long festival of revel, revelry, drunkenness, orgies, and the slaughter of the Lord of Misrule. They actually had sacrifices. Sometimes people say that they sacrifice somebody every day for 12 days or at least animals or people sometimes. The last day celebrated December 25th in association with the rebirth of the sun. This date and its customs were adopted to replace the pagan ideas and turned into the birthday of the Messiah. So Santa is actually O-D-I-N, O-D-I-N, or M-O-L-O-C-H. That's what the lap is involved. That's what the lap is all about. Sitting on his lap and writing eight reindeer through the, air, through the uh, skies, the eight-legged horse of Schlipner, you know. In fact, Schlipner, the word in the Old Norse, the horse that O-D-I-N rode through the heavens or, you know, Valhalla, the word itself, Schlipner, the horse, the name of the horse, means gliding. That's what it means, like gliding through the snow, actually gliding through the air. 
We must not adopt or learn pagan customs. Again, guard yourself that you're not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you and that you do not inquire about their mighty ones, saying, how did these nations serve their mighty ones? And let me do so too. Do not do so to Yahuwah, your Elohim. For every abomination which Yahuwah hates, they have done to their mighty ones. For they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their mighty ones. All the words I am commanding you, guard to do it, and do not add to it nor take away from it. In the year 1647, according to Dennis, Christmas was outlawed by Christians in England. The paganism won after riots and mayhem overtook the realm. Here's a public notice of that. Now, from, fi from 1659 to 1681, the celebration of Christmas was outlawed in Boston. That's in the United States here. Anyone exhibiting the Christmas spirit was fined five shillings. So Christianity and Christmas are based upon this, M-I-T-H-R-A-I-S-M. And that's the rebirth, that, that deity was also born. Here's a list of the deities that were born on December 25th. And the first one on the list, of course, is uh, this deity for the Romans worshiped. Actually, it's from Persia, but they adopted it. And then B-A-A-L and H-E-L-I-O-U-S and, you know, all these sun deities. So the conclusion is that this masquerader, this master of disguises, <coughs> is Satan and it's his birthday. December 25th is Satan's birthday and it's just operating as a counterfeit to get all the world caught up in it. Now let him who has knowledge of the set apart one of Yisrael answer these questions. Proverbs 30 asks these questions. Who has gone up to the heavens and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you know it? And the name is not the Lord. It is not B-A-A-L. And he does not celebrate his birthday. The birthday of his son, and his son doesn't celebrate it either. Now, here's the awakening at the time of the end. We're supposed to be awakened. This is the scripture that explains that. There's others, but this one is, is in Daniel 12. It says, now at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great head who is standing over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of distress, such as never was since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth wake up, some to everlasting life and some to reproaches and ever everlasting abhorrence. And those who have insight shall shine like the brightness of the expanse, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, hide the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall diligently search, and knowledge shall increase. Now, why the distress? There's some, some of the reasons. In Yermiyahu, or Jeremiah 16, it says, And it shall be when you declare to this people all these words, and they shall say to you, Why has Yahuwah pronounced all this great evil against us? And what is our crookedness, and what is our sin that we have committed against Yahuwah, our Elohim? Then you shall say to them, because your fathers have forsaken me, declares Yahuwah, and have walked after other mighty ones, and have served them and bowed themselves to them. When you bow down to a tree to put your present under the tree, you're bowing down to the tree. And have forsaken me, and did not guard my Torah. And you have done more evil than your fathers. For look, each one walks according to the stubbornness of his own heart, of his own evil heart, without listening to me. So I shall throw you out of this land into a land that you do not know, neither you nor your fathers. And there you shall, get, so shall serve other mighty ones day and night, where I show you no favor. Therefore, see the days are coming, declares Yahuwah, when it is no longer said, Yahuwah lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Mitzrayim. 
But Yahuwah lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from the lands where he had driven them. For I shall bring them back into their land I gave to their fathers. See, I am sending for many fishermen, declares Yahuwah, and they shall fish them. And after that, I shall send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. That's a global hunt. O Yahuwah, my strength and my stronghold and my refuge in the day of distress, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited only falsehood, futility, and there is no value in them. Would a man make mighty ones for himself, which are not mighty ones? Therefore, see, I am causing them to know. This time I cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is Yahuwah. Overthrowing strongholds is what we're all trying to do. The strongholds are mental fortresses of our own thinking. The battlefield is always in the mind of mankind. In 2 Corinthians, it explains this in chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we, we, we do not fight according to the flesh. For the weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim for overthrowing strongholds, overthrowing reasonings, and every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim, taking captive every thought to make it obedient to the Messiah, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. So we need to overthrow these reasonings. See, that's some, 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 those are symbols. The Nazarim guard two main things, the name of Yahuwah and the word of Yahuwah, which is his Torah. In Psalm 138, it says, I bow myself towards your set-apart heckel, temple, and give thanks to your name for your kindness and for your truth. For you have made great your word, your name above all. Those two things. Number 6, 23 says, Speak to Aharon and to his son, saying, This is how you are to bless the children of Israel. Say to them, Yahuwah bless you and guard you. Yahuwah make his face shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahuwah lift up his face upon you and give you peace. Now our commission that was given to us as Yahushua was leaving it's an order to reach, to teach righteousness, and it's at Matthew 28, starting at verse 19. Therefore, go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the set-apart Spirit. The name is what, the, <coughs> what, we're, what we're proclaiming. Teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. There's, that's the message to the nations. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. Amen. So the Nazarene, which means guardians, watchmen, we watch very carefully over the Torah and his name. We guard his name and his word. Now Occam's razor, William of Occam, he basically distilled that, everything down to its essential points, and that would be to teach them the name and to teach them the Torah of Yahuwah. Seek first the kingdom of Yahuwah, and his righteousness, and that's, the, that's it. So we know his name, and we know his righteousness. Righteousness is defined by his mind, which is in his covenant. We're the, we of the covenant call to those who sit in darkness. So there's the evidence, if anybody needs it, for the origin of the word G-O-D. It's a common Norse or Teutonic word for personal object of religious worship. And it was formerly applicable to superhuman beings of heathen myth. And on conversion of Teutonic races to Christianity, this term was applied to the supreme being, which they don't seem to know who that is, but in the dictionary, that's what they tell you. But who is the supreme being? What is his name? Who is the mighty one, of, the Elohim of esteem? The mighty one, the Elohim of esteem is Yahuwah. He only has one name. So there you have it. And I hope you all uh, weren't too offended by some of the terms, but this is the truth, and I just didn't want to you know, hold anything back from you because how can I not tell you the truth? <laughs>